Hey everyone, welcome to my channel. My name is Amanda and this is a vlog of my late autism and ADHD diagnosis and also talk about having aphantasia and a memory disorder called SDAM, severely deficient autobiographical memory on occasion. Um, this is going to be an Amanda's Rambles, some of my favorite content. My last two videos were a little bit more um, educational bent on the ABCs of autism for Autism Awareness and Acceptance Month, which is in April. And I just thought it would be kind of a fun way to put a lot of topics about autism in a fairly streamlined way, because y'all know that I talk off the cuff, I don't pre-script anything, so <laughs> that's about as straightforward of content as you're gonna get from me. Um, first off, I want to say, I was just like, had this thought in my head today as I was setting up my camera. Um, thank you to like people who watch a lot of my content and you see the same boring background every time. Like I know I'm used to try to make more of an effort of like sitting on different parts of my couch. Sometimes I'd go out in my living room in the summer. I took a um, couple videos outside. I know it's kind of interesting to have a different dynamic, but a lot of people actually listen to my content more of just like as a podcast because I don't really have that many visuals that pop up on the screen very often. Um, but what it really comes down to is executive functioning disorder, part of being autistic and ADHD. And there's so many times where just propping up this particular tripod on, on my desk, um, which is like in front of a window. Here, let me give you a tour of my office right now. And this is completely spontaneous. I did not know that I was going to do this. Otherwise, I probably would have cleaned up a little bit more. There is some jeans that don't fit that I got to return to Amazon. I have a nice big TV. There's my giant desk. Oh, here's Watson, ever present and often snoring in the background of my um, videos. His froggy bed got turned around. <laughs> That's so disappointing. Anyway, it's a really cute frog. Here, I'm gonna put a, a photo up of his frog bed because uh, I don't want to disturb him in his sleep. And then, yeah, there's my couch that I do film some of my videos on and some of my favorite stuffies and a little faux moment going over here because I wanted greenery and I keep killing everything that I try to grow some artwork from my teens and some artwork that I did that I have a video where I talk about how this was like a very intense hyper focus that I painted all seven of those in something like 42 hours. Crazy. Oh yeah. And then I've got a box of dog toys, different shoes, and then a trash bag of donation. That tripod is the one that I'll use when I'm sitting on the couch, but it's harder to use. So there you have it. There's a little tour of my office space. I really love it. It's where I paint. It's where I vlog. It's where I wrote my book. Um, I don't know if you saw my computer in this corner. I think I showed it. And I have a big open space where I'll do workout stuff. Um, you saw my weights right there. So yeah, I don't know. Just thought I would share it. I, I like it when YouTubers show off their space and I don't think I've really done that very much. Um, anyway, <laughs> so yeah, me just rambles. I am feeling a lot better. Um, I want to give y'all a medication update. Hold on, I'm going to turn on this lamp. The, we're in that time of year where the light um, I got my curtain down because the light was too bright and then it's too dim. Okay, so yeah, I wanted to give y'all a medication update. Um, I would mentioned a couple videos back that my doctor had put me on, Lexapro. So originally, for anybody who hasn't um, been following along, um, I got diagnosed at 42, so I've never been on any kind of medication. I actually was temporarily on Lexapro for like a brief moment in time right before my diagnosis where I got incorrectly diagnosed 
as having depression, but then we learned it was really dep- um, burnout, autistic burnout, not depression. So at that point, I'd only taken a couple of Lexapro pills, not enough to even know if how it would affect me. Um, and we, we had stopped that. I didn't do any medication for a long time. And I focused on getting my kids' medication set up. And I'm glad I did that. If I had tried to do my medication at the same time as theirs, that would have been really hard. <laughs> because I need my brain to be focusing as much as possible while I was trying to sort their meds out. Um, and they are both on anxiety and ADHD meds. And um, so yeah, first my doctor put me on Wellbutrin. I had an allergic reaction. It's pretty rare. I got covered in rashes. It was absolutely miserable had to stop the Wellbutrin. A lot of people respond well to Wellbutrin for ADHD. A lot of times it's, it's prescribed for depression, but it's also very effective as a non-stimulant for ADHD. And so since I had an allergic reaction to the Wellbutrin, we tried Stratera. Stratera just didn't do anything for me. Like we went decently high on the dose. Oh God, that scared me. Um, I'm not wearing my watch today because it was uh, sensory bothering me. But that uh, got a message in and it vibrated. Okay. Um, the straight hair didn't do anything for me. So we stopped that. And then the doctor and I decided we were going to try to match an anxiety med and then pair it with, a, we're going to try a stimulant ADHD medication later. Now I may end up just going unmedicated, but I have heard from a lot of late diagnosed ADHD people that the medications were really worth it. And, um, they are, were so glad that they had the opportunity to get on ADHD, ADHD meds. So I'm like, you know, if I go through a bunch and nothing seems to work, then I'm, I have made it 44 years without meds. I can probably keep going. Um, but also as I get older, I am struggling more, especially with burnout. So I'm like, let's see what the tools are available and help me. So that's when she started me on Lexapro. And unfortunately, Lexapro basically gave me depression. Um, I started at five milligrams, went up to 10 milligrams, and the 10 milligrams made me feel like an absolute zombie. I was spending all my day on this couch. I would get up and do the minimum I had to for functioning as an adult. I did film a couple videos during that. Like one of the, I think the first ABC video was on a hard, really hard day but it was like, I was just trying to push through, trying to make myself um, feel something. Like I was feeling very, very dead inside on the Lexapro. So then she, I talked to the doctor about that. And she's like, no, 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 that's not what we want. So she took me back down to five milligrams. And then now I have been off, sorry, adjusting my window a little bit. I've been off of the Lexapro for a few days and it's like, Oh my gosh, like I feel interested in doing things again. That's a relief because that was really scary. Not even wanting to want to do stuff is not um, something that feels good at all. So um, now I'm probably just going to go unmedicated until I'm meeting with a brand new doctor at the end of May. And so... I don't have an opportunity to get in an appointment with my current doctor and I'm switching doctors, like I said, at the end of May. So I'm probably just going to wait and talk to the new doctor and see. And I'm really excited to meet with her. She, on her bio, uh, so my current doctor is moving out of the country and it's blessing in disguise. I love her. I've had her for 11 years. Um, she's been great, but she really just doesn't know much about autism. She obviously, she's a family doctor and I've been with her since my kids were five and she did not see the signs of autism in all three of us. Um, 
so she's a good doctor because unfortunately there's too many doctors who don't know how to recognize autism general practitioners and um she i think is starting to current get on current research and she's like oh i didn't realize autism presented this way and i think she's she was starting to learn but now she's moving and so i'm forced to find a new doctor which i think is going to be a blessing in disguise so i found a new doctor that i am excited to meet with um they are queer and neurodivergent listed on their bio i don't no, if neurodivergent means that they are also they are autistic ADHD. Um, ADHD could be by like neurodivergent is a big umbrella term. Typically, in this kind of phrasing on um, biographies, if medical professionals are going to use it, it kind of alludes to autism or ADHD. I don't um, know many medical professionals that are open about being bipolar or um, other types of neurodivergencies at this point which you know again is unfortunate because like me somebody who is autistic finding another doctor that is autistic is actually a check mark and you know if i was bipolar i would probably be really happy to find a doctor who is bipolar and able to manage their um, disorder enough to like be a doctor right um i think having that kind of transparency is going to be awesome and great and i'm glad to see that there have been doctors that are now doing this now i have found this was by accident my eye doctor that i've been going to for a long time hired a new eye doctor to join their practice and she's adhd and she was open about that i'm like oh my gosh that's really awesome um she's not autistic or doesn't know she's autistic. Whenever someone says that they are ADHD, there's like a tiny part of me that always wonders like, oh, I wonder if you're both because there is such a high comorbidity of autism and ADHD. But you know, there I have met people that are ADHD and not autistic. And there are definitely people who are autistic and not ADHD. I do believe they are separate diagnoses, but there is a lot of overlap. Um, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but it's a huge overlap but so yeah this eye doctor has adhd which i again find really great because there's actually a lot i've done a couple videos on eyes there's a lot that your eyes can be affected by autism whether it's light sensitivity binocular vision um astigmat no not astigmatism um i think it's called astigmas it's the one where your eyes shake um, a lot of people whose eyes shake not everybody but that is also a high comor comorbidity of being autistic too um, and my current eye doctor before the ADHD one um, when I was telling her all of these things she had no idea she'd never heard of it never realized that there was so many eye problems with autism and um, my son's physical therapist he's autistic um my new talk therapist is autistic adhd so i am actually trying to actively put medical professionals in my life who are autistic because autism and adhd affect so much of the body and i think that um until more general practitioners get caught up on this information um, finding people who it's in their own best interest to learn about autism and ADHD. I think that's the way, and I'm glad that I've been able to find these kinds of doctors with networking. And like I said, a couple of them actually putting it on their biographies. Um, they're still a lot of times using neurodivergent instead of autism. Like my current therapist, her bio says neurodivergent, um, on psychology today, I'm pretty sure. But when I talked to her, she said that she was autistic ADHD and I'm like, yes. And, um, I've been seeing her for a couple months now and she's been a really good fit. I absolutely loved my old therapist, but, um, I just got to a point where I felt like having an autistic therapist was where the direction I needed to go. 
and that was really really hard to make that change like so hard but in the end I think it all worked out for the best um hold on I'm gonna pause for a minute because I'm gonna see where else I want to ramble well I don't know no I'm not because like I don't like pausing <laughs> the video I like just for y'all to be able to see autism in its natural state and how our brains and, and ADHD and the tangents. Um, I all of a sudden, as soon as I said, let me pause so I can think about what I want to talk about next. Boom, two topics popped straight into my head. The first one is that I'm currently as of um, it's Saturday, um, kind of late afternoon, locked out of the threads app and Instagram. And I'm, my autistic sense of justice is really riled up about it. I'm very irritated and I'm frustrated because I can see the comments that people are leaving on my profile, but I can't comment and I can't make a new post. I was able to make one post on Instagram before I got locked out. So at least there's that. But basically this morning, like really early in the morning, I left a completely benign comment on somebody's um, Instagram post. There was a news article about online dating. Um, it was really like kind of a fluff piece. It wasn't anything like super new, noteworthy. Um, but somebody had commented, oh my gosh, this is the current push for people to couple up and have babies. And I wrote, I'm like, this isn't a current push. That's like been ongoing. Like people try and get women to procreate. It's been like life goals for men forever now I'm um paraphrasing my own words here I didn't go into that many details because you know it was just a short little comment but I did say this isn't a current push and then I said I'm happily married for 21 years but I really support people who don't want to partner up or if they want to partner up in any way that they want and then I put and I also support childless by choice that was my comment it was like so benign somebody reported it um a spam and apparently that got me locked out of threads at first because i tried to make a post on threads about something completely different and i got this like pop-up message that says that you've been locked out until um april 27th and i'm like what and then so i went to instagram and made a post because uh, oh and then when I went back to Instagram, I got that message that that comment had been reported. And so I made an Instagram post about it and a story. But then right after that, I got locked out of Instagram and I haven't been able to leave comments. I have tried to appeal it. Um, I haven't heard anything from Instagram yet and it's been like over eight hours. So hopefully somebody will read my appeal and realize by reading that comment that it is not spam that it was just conversation on a topic that was not harmful so i'm really irritated um i really enjoy using threads i use it as my brain dump kind of place <laughs> um because otherwise i will tend to text friends too much because i process out loud which is one reason why i do this channel also and threads has been a really good way for me to like, when I have a thought in my head, boom, I can get it out in the world. Um, so if you're not following me on threads and uh, cause I'm on there like every day, <laughs> same username, follow me on threads. Um, if you want, if you don't want to, it's fine too. Like that doesn't bother me. I cannot, I can't, I cannot believe that I'm almost at 28,000 followers on this channel. It, blows my mind. I love you guys. I appreciate you. Um, I love that our community is growing and that I have helped so many people. Um, I don't know, like either realize they're autistic, realize that autism isn't a bad thing. Um, another thing that this is a little bit of my story I haven't told in a while. So it's something that took me a while to realize. And I've said it from the beginning, but I haven't said it like quite so concisely. I've always been a disability advocate. Ever since I was a teenager, I was a disability advocate. Um, maybe even younger than that, actually. I just my first 
big piece of advocacy that I remember was in high school where I wrote a paper about um, teaching, like using alternative language for Down syndrome, um, such as AAC devices and or sign language to Down syndrome kids who did not have vocal cords strong enough to speak. And I actually did my huge, big, um, one of, I don't remember what grade level it was, but it was a huge, huge, huge research paper on that. And it was one of my biggest first, like, public, I guess, things of advocacy. But basically, what I'm trying to say is that I have never viewed being disabled as negative or less than. Disabled to me has always been different, not less. It's just a variety of the human condition. And I have always just like, I don't even, I like I said, oh, I only put this concisely. And now I'm like at a loss for words. Um, basically, you know, ableism is systematic in our culture like it is woven into the fabric of our society so internalized ableism is part of our current culture and human experience too there have been people who have done the work to deconstruct that about themselves and so they have maybe less internalized ableism than somebody who hasn't and so for me because of how I have felt about disabled people since a very, very young age, my internalized ableism is a lot lower. I still have it because I did not know I was part of the disabled community. So even though I was always an advocate and ally for disabled people, I never had that mirror up and was like, oh, that's me too, until my diagnosis. But when I got diagnosed, autistic and ADHD um, like a little over a year and a half ago, it wasn't anything that I had to deal with as far as the disabled word. Like to me, like that was not even a concern. It's one reason why I was able to just jump into this channel right away. And like, I am autistic proud, I'm disabled proud, like pride um, that there's no built-in shame or upset or um, anything like that around my diagnosis that many, many, many people have to journey through. That's like part of their aut late autism and ADHD diagnosis. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, that is very valid part of many of your journeys. But I'm here for you to watch and see the other side of that um, and maybe get you there quicker because while autism is a disability and there are very, very hard, hard parts of being both autistic and ADHD, um, there's nothing wrong with being autistic or ADHD. That is ableist people trying to make us feel a certain way that is a reflection of who they are, not us. Like, I still have so many conversations in online spaces with even autistic ADHD people who are so in the same mindset of a neurotypical person that they are not seeing that their, their own internalized ableism around a subject. For instance, there is an ongoing conversation about how neuro, oh, I had the most beautiful uh, simile the other day. Neurotypical people, when they converse, it's like they're building a quilt. There's like blocks of stories. They share, then they wait, and then you share, and then they wait, and then and there's lots of questions, and it's like chunks. But Autistic or ADHD people, we weave a conversation together. We're overlapping, interjecting, interrupting, and we weave a tapestry. It's not blocks like a quilt. So whenever I bring up this conversation, and I say when an autistic person is sharing a relatable story, it's how we empathize and show that we're understanding what the other person's talking about. 
So many people will say, no, that's recentering the conversation. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to listen and ask questions. And I'm like, no, that is a neurotypical way of having a conversation. It's a valid conversation style, but the autistic conversation of weaving and sharing relatable stories and empathizing the way that is natural for us is also a valid conversation style. And people say, no, it's rude to interrupt. You need to not, and even autistic and ADHD people will say this. They'll say, it is rude to interrupt somebody. You need to listen. And I was like, no, it's not rude because it's my natural self-expression. For me to change how I would naturally express myself is called masking, which is hard for my brain. Masking damages your brain. What we need is awareness so that way neurotypical people can do some of the emotional mental labor of having this conversation style with an autistic person and understand when they're interrupting, they're not being rude, they're continuing a conversation. And the awareness can go both ways. Like I have a friend who was holistic. We had a two hour lunch. I did try to hold myself in check, let her finish her conversations before. And, you know, she also knows that I'm autistic. So when I interrupted, like she gave me that kind of grace. And because we were both aware of each other's conversation styles, it worked. Both of us had to give a little bit to communicate, but, you know, we both left the lunch feeling good. Like we both got to share our stories. When I have a... Um, I went to tea earlier this week with a friend who's autistic and we just <laughs> the whole time interrupting each other, but it was beautiful. It was like I said, weaving that tapestry, like sh as she's finishing a sentence, I'm starting the next sentence and it's like this and it builds, but we both know that that's how we communicate. So going back to the person who's like, it's rude and they might even be autistic themselves because that's what they were told. They were told over and over and over interrupting is rude. And it's like, no, it's just a different conversation style. Now, you know, I think if you constantly are overlapping and not letting someone finish a sentence, you know, there is times to kind of like learn. And again, that give and take, hold on Watson, my pug now wants out of the room. And I will add the caveat because everybody always does. Like, it's like these, like autistic people, we always want that. Like, but, but what about this? Because we, we do, we want the whole picture, right? We want to understand everything. And somebody's like, well, what if someone's in trauma? Like, what if somebody is sharing that they had a miscarriage? That's the time when you do. You want to just listen, whether it does not matter their brain type at that point. You want to listen to their entire story, give them space and empathize with them the best way you know how. It may be still by sharing a relatable story, but you gotta be careful in that one because um, your experience may not match their experience. Most of the time when someone is sharing trauma, you just want to listen. And that is not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about these conversation blocks. Everyone always brings that up and that, <laughs> It, it's funny because that is a, hold on, pug. We all know that's like an outlier conversation. Like most of the time, most of the day, we are not interacting people with people and they're like sharing their traumas with us. Unless, oh my gosh, it's getting really dark in here now. I don't know. Unless you're like a therapist, people aren't just sharing their traumas with you in and out all day long. Like that's often a very reserved type of conversation most of the conversations we're having are just like you know the funny story that happened to us when we were at the dog park and then it reminds you of a funny story that you had last time you were at the dog park that's what i'm talking about um the you know 99 percent of types of conversations we have in this world but it is important to, you know, talk about like, yeah, if someone is sharing something traumatic and it is good for you to give them that space and let them kind of take the lead in that conversation. But like I said, it's like that, like give and take and just the awareness and removing the ableism of that a neurotypical type of conversation is better and that 
autistic, I mean, autistic and ADHD people need to learn how to converse this way. No. Non-autistic people need to learn that their conversation pattern is not the only valid conversation style. Diversity, people. Diversity. Anyway, um, I could ramble on and on and on, but I will wrap up here. I am feeling a lot better. Um, we'll see. <laughs> I like feeling better does not mean that, oh, okay, I just don't want to do ADHD meds because I'm still struggling with executive functioning. It is, you know, like I said, late afternoon and I was going to do this video first thing this morning. Um, so there's definitely like a, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, an argument that, you know, ADHD meds would definitely help me achieve the goals that I want to achieve in my life. So I am going to pursue that path for a little bit longer, but getting off of the Lexapro, which again, works for some people. Um, my friend that I was talking to earlier this week, she is on Lexapro and she said it has been the best game changer for her, but for me, because that's what we all have different brain types or brains or whatever. It was not the right one for me. It made me such a zombie. Oh God, I would not wish that on anybody. It was horrible. <clears throat> anyway thank you guys for um sitting with me and until the next video bye